Delegate Malone, please give the Pledge of Allegiance and prayer. Good morning, please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to, the flag to the flag of the United States, States of, America of America and to the Republic the for which it stands, which it stands one, nation, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, liberty and, and justice, justice for, all. for all. The prayer this morning uh, originated in my thoughts due to the fact that on Monday is the 111th anniversary of scalps in the United States. Furthermore, on Monday, the United States will be recognizing the first female scouts and scouts BSA, which I think is also in an exciting moment. Scouts has always been bipartisan. Uh, Gerald Ford was an Eagle Scout and Martin Luther King was a scout from age 11 to 13. And he was actually part of his scout troop was his father's church and his father was the representative to the scout organization. So with that fun facts, please join me in what's called the camper's prayer. God of the mountains and hills, make us tall and strong, tall enough and strong enough to right some wrong. God of the stars, make us steadfast and sure. God of the trees and woods, keep us fresh and pure. God of every lake and stream, flow through our lives and make them clean. Let us do nothing base or mean. God of the rain, wash from our lives all dirt and stain. Pure and strong, let us remain. God of night and day, through shadows or light, be our stay. Guide our way, God of radiant sun, light our life. God of the evening peace and quiet, keep us free from fear and strife. God of glorious dawn, Make each day a fresh start. God of the free flying birds, sing in our hearts. God of the surging waves and sea, wide horizons give to us. Help us to see the world as you would have it to be. God of morning dew, each day renew our faith. God of all morning things and growing things, keep us growing too. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Delegate Malone. At this time, I'd like to introduce our guest. We have some very special guests with us today. We have the mayor of the city of Annapolis, Mayor Gavin Buckley. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you. We also have um, Adrian Mickler, Catherine Gray, Jennifer Corbin, all from the Anne Arundel County Mental Health Agency. Thank you, welcome. We have Senator Sarah Alfred. Thank you for being here. And I believe that is everyone. Oh, we also have um, David Gerald, uh, city manager. Is he on? Ah, oh, there you are. Good to see you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So um, we're going to begin with a vote this morning. But before we begin, I have a few things I want to uh, go over. Uh, to bring to your attention. The chair wishes to utilize uh, rules 11 and 12 in which eight affirmative votes will be sufficient for a bill to be sponsored by the delegation. Eight affirmative votes will also be sufficient for a bill to receive the favorable <laughs> recommendation of the delegation. This should um, expedite our meetings um, just a bit since we uh, are in this uh, Zoom Brady Box format. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Seeing none. The chair recognizes Delegate Shanika Henson, Chair of the Public Health Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning to our guests. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Madam Chair, the Public Health Subcommittee met on yesterday, February 4th. Um, all committee members were in attendance. At that meeting, we had an update from Anne Arundel County's health officer on the county's COVID response, and we considered one piece of legislation, House Bill 524, Anne Arundel and Prince George's County repossession for failure to pay rent, rental property, license information. The bill's sponsor was in attendance, Delegate Lehman, and on hand to answer questions as well. 
the piece of legislation was recommended unanimously favorable to the delegation for support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is there a motion on the bill? So moved. Second. Second to the motion. Second. Well, are there any questions or discussion? Uh, Delegate Ned Carey. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, yeah, I just have one quick question. Just wanted to remind myself, as a matter of fact, I tried to reach out to Delegate Lehman. Um, just wanted to make sure that basically what we're doing is, is we're not creating, you know, this isn't going to affect the, you know, the, the local person who owns the house next door. This only applies to people who have two or more dwelling units, correct? That's correct. And Delegate Kerry, I'm sorry if I missed any um, calls or attempts to reach me. I do apologize. I did oh, not that, realize. That, that, that's okay, Delegate. Um, but no, I just wanted to make sure that we're not putting, you know, further burden, or we're not creating a new burden for people who don't have it. Now. Oh, I say a burden, a, a new regulation for people who don't have it now. No, we, we are not. This is a, a licensing requirement that already exists. It applies to the landlords. It applies to, we had a discussion uh, with the full committee um, last week about uh, duplexes, for example, or right. uh, owner-occupied homes. Um, in, in Prince George's County, this bill applies to both. In Prince George's, um, uh, landlords have to have a uh, license to rent, uh, you know, uh, like their basement as a separate unit. In Anne Arundel, they do not. Um, okay. Yeah. And that doesn't change anything. That's no, the, it absolutely no, it does not. Okay. No, it doesn't create a new license. No, not at all. Thank you, delegate. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? Will the secretary take a roll call vote? Delegate Bagnell? Yes. Delegate Barnes? Yes. Delegate Carey? Yes. Delegate Chang? Yes. Delegate Chisholm? Yes. Delegate Henson? Yes. Delegate Howard? Yes. Delegate Jones? Yes. Delegate Kipke? Yes. Delegate Lehman? Yes. Delegate Malone? Yes. Delegate Pena Melnick? Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Saab. Yes. Delegate Chairman Bartlett. Yes. Madam Chairman, the vote is 15 to zero and the motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Having received eight affirmative votes, uh, House Bill 524 will receive a favorable recommendation of the delegation. Secretary, please send the appropriate letter to the chair of the Judiciary Committee at the required time. Next, we will have bill hearings. First bill we will hear is Delegate Chisholm's bill, House Bill 662, Anne Arundel County Property Tax Credit for Business Entity State of Emergency. Delegate Chisholm. Un you're on, you need to unmute Delegate Chisholm. Somebody keeps switching my button. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, Anne Arundel County Delegation and guests. Um, for the record, I'm Delegate Brian Chisholm here to present uh, House Bill 662. If it's okay with you, Madam Chair, what I'd like to do is just give a couple words of clarity, um, an explanation on the bill, and then I'd like to turn it over to uh, Matt Carpenter, who is our legal counsel for Anne Arundel County to handle some of the technical points of the bill. Good. Okay. So just as, as a point of clarity, this bill does not suggest, instruct, mandate Anne Arundel County to do anything it does not wish to do. All it's doing is what we've been trying to do for the last 10 months, and that is to empower some of the local governments uh, with the authorization to do more on their own to provide relief where, we, where they feel it's necessary. If they don't feel like this would provide any relief or be a benefit to any businesses, type of businesses or, or zip codes, then they simply put it in the drawer and it never does anything. Once again, this is just a bill to give the local county government in Anne Arundel County greater flexibility to provide relief where it can. 
And at this point, I just I'll yield over to uh, Matt Carpenter for the technical part of the bill. Morning. Uh, again, this is House Bill 662, sponsored by Delegate Grissom. Uh, in summary, this bill authorizes Anne Arundel County to grant a property tax credit for real property that is owned or leased by a business and has been affected by the state of emergency declared under Title 14 of the Public Safety Article. Anne Arundel County may provide by law for the amount and duration of the property tax credit, additional eligibility criteria for the credit, regulations and procedures for the application and uniform processing of requests for the credit and any other provision necessary to carry out this property tax credit. The bill takes effect June 1st, 2021 and applies to the taxable years beginning after June 30th, 2021. Delegate Chisholm, do you have any other witnesses? No, Madam Chair, I do not. Okay, no problem. So are there any questions for the bill sponsor or uh, for uh, Matt Carpenter? Madam Chair, I have a question. Delegate Henson. Thank you. Delegate Chisholm, I wanna make sure I understand the fiscal or the potential fiscal impact to Anne Arundel County if they adopted the enabling legislation. The fiscal note that was attached, it, uh, it, it wasn't able to give us any certainty on what it would look like. It had the different business sectors, how many properties were owned by the different business sectors and the assessed value of those properties, but boiling that down to what that looks like in terms of the Delta for the county and revenue. Do we have an understanding of what that looks like? No, and, and I think the reason the fiscal note writers put that in there is just so you would have an idea of how much property tax many of these businesses and industries pay. So for instance, I'm just gonna pick agriculture at the top and I don't know what type of emergency we would have where it just affected agriculture. It gives an idea of their assessed value. And if it was taxed at 2.3% or 3.2%, then you would figure it out from there. And once again, this is just authorizing the Anne Arundel County to be able to do something like this. Right now they cannot. So they would then figure in their, their property tax um, or code, if we cut this, if we make a property tax credit for this industry, it's going to cost us this much, and they may very well have to move some money around. But I think what, what we got to always keep in mind is we're not always talking about the pandemic we just went through, where it was a very broad sweeping pandemic and emergency that affected everybody. Now, it affected some businesses more than others, but God forbid something happens to a certain zip code where you know, maybe, maybe they're attacked for some reason and the county then has the ability to say, every one of these businesses has been shut down because of this emergency. We have to be able to provide some relief to them. We've shut down their business. We don't wanna take their businesses from them because they can't pay their property tax on a business they can't pay. So I know that that's a, a long answer and I wish I could give you a solid answer. Nobody's ever gonna know the physical impact until the county decides hey, we want, to, we want to do this. This is where we're going to do it, and it's going to cost us X. We then can make up X here, or we don't make it up at all. Thank you, Dr. Chisholm. And the, the bills, um, the intention behind it, I think, is, is, is noble and clear. I just wanted to make sure that we had some uh, estimation, some, some way to propose what the fiscal impact might be when the employees of those businesses are not able to go in and do business and get regular wages, the county has to step in and provide relief for them, provide eviction prevention assistance, provide uh, food assistance, all those different needs still have to be met for the employees. And so I'm trying to understand in times where revenues are down for everybody, what that would look like for the county's bottom line and their ability to still be able to deliver services to those persons that were affected by the business closure. Madam Chair, if I may ask one additional question. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to um, just ask about, and this may be more appropriate for Mr. Carpenter, the provision in there where it talks about businesses that were leased as well. I just wanted to be clear, that tax benefit would not be going to the business owner in that instance, it'd be going to the property owner that owns the property and is responsible for the taxes. Is that correct? That would be correct. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Chair, may I um, answer one other thing that Delegate Henson said? Yes. Because I think it's important. I think she makes a very good and valid point. And that is, 
one of the one of the industries I was helping a lot in the last 10 months was the restaurant industry because they were they were punched in the mouth all week long and twice on Sunday. And one of the most interesting things I found is I found somewhere called an economic tracker. And it showed that restaurants employed more low income people than anybody. And they lost 48% of their businesses and these employees were hurt. So my intent with the bill, when I looked at it, is we always have to do everything we can to keep some of these businesses open because they are the ones that are providing for, for our most vulnerable and the ones that need a weekly paycheck and need the health benefits. The government can't always come in as quickly and help a lot of these people, as you know, and, and it's terrible when some of these people lose their jobs to no fault of their own. So if we can keep a business open, that's always better than hoping the government's gonna come in as we've all seen, it's tough for the government to move on a dime. And this is just one of those tools in the toolbox that hopefully Anne Arundel County never has to use, but if it does, it, it can help to save a job, save an employee. And that's what the intent was. Thank you, Delegate Chisholm. Uh, Delegate Howard has a question. Hey, thanks, uh, Delegate Chisholm. So it, it, like the County Council would decide the amount of relief or? The County Executive and the County Council, just like they, decide anything budgetary at this point. Okay, so the people that would be directly affected to this would have a voice about their concerns or positive reaction to this through their local elected officials? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Delegate Jocelyn Pena Melnick. Thank you and good morning, Madam Chair. It's good to see you there. Good morning, um, Good morning, thank my you. colleagues. I, would, I just have a, a question. I, I love the bill and, and, I, and everyone is suffering and our, our businesses need the help. Have, what is the position of the county um, council or the county executive? Do we have one? And I apologize if we have it and I haven't seen it. We have a letter of support from Councilman Nathan Volke. We sent a um, inquiry letter over to the county executive and they responded with a political answer, but not really in opposition or in favor. So it was, it was that if we, if we applied it in a certain way, then it could have um, property tax rates go up for other people, much like we did when we passed the law that gives firefighters, police officers, a tax credit on their property tax, even though this is business wise. But once again, all we're trying to do is put it in their hands and they can they can do with it what whatever they wish but it's enabling legislation correct correct thank you seeing no further questions um, this bill will be heard in ways and means on thursday on tuesday uh february 9th and the bill uh will go to our uh public health committee uh for review I'd like to recognize at this time, Senator Beidle. Before we begin um, the bill hearings on the four alcohol bills, I wanna make sure everyone has a clear understanding and has had a chance to review the February 3rd email from the uh, Econo Economic Matters Chair. Um, this bill, I mean, this email provides a couple of changes some changes, some just basic announcements. One, if you didn't know, today is your last day to uh, introduce your bills. So they need to be, that needs to be taken care of um, by 5 p.m. today. Um, the local um, alcohol beverage bill hearings will be heard on February 19th. And Chairman Davis asked that all bills be in by today. It is the policy of ECM that if there is no, um, if the bill is not in today, there will be no bill hearing. Letters of support and any amendments need to go to the uh, Economic Matters Chair without delay and definitely before February 19th. And as you know, the speaker has directed that no amendments to add co-sponsors or to change the sponsorship to delegation uh, will be entertained. So each alcohol bill will be, um, will be sponsored by the member. There will be no Anne Arundel County sponsored um, alcohol bills. Lastly, um, 
as I mentioned, um, it is ECM's policy that if the bill is not introduced, is not in by the introduction deadline today, then there will, there will not be a bill hearing. Are there any questions regarding these updates, announcements, and Delegate Rogers? Uh, uh, yes, Madam Chair, just for additional clarification, and I know you mentioned this, is that the um, all alcohol bills being heard by ECM, although they will have uh, individual sponsors this year, they will require a letter from the delegation stating that the delegation supports it. So um, just wanted to make sure that we, I reaffirm that. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I appreciate that, that, um, that reaffirm. Okay, any questions or further comments? Seeing none, let's hear some alcohol bills. First bill is um, by, will be uh, Delegate Rogers. We have uh, House Bill 679 and second bill will be Delegate Rogers, which we'll just move right on into after that, which is House Bill 680. Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I'd like to um, just, you know, under auspices of transparency, make sure that uh, the delegation knows that after presenting these bills, the uh, alcohol subcommittee will meet on Monday to um, further deliberate on any additional questions that may um, come about as a result of today's testimony, and at which time we should be able to um, vote on a, a um, letter of support for the delegation next Friday. So with that uh, in mind, uh, I would like to start with uh, HB uh, 679. And um, I will have uh, my good Senator from uh, District 32, um, who needs no introduction, Senator Bido, who will um, uh, help me in terms of assisting with the, the testimony on behalf of the bill. But what HD uh, HB 679 does is it's a class movie theater license that creates um, a beer, wine, uh, liquor license uh, for movie theaters in Anne Arundel County. Um, the license would cost uh, $1,200 and the license holder will need to obtain, would, would not need to obtain a separate uh, Sunday license. And so with that, uh, I would like to turn it over to Senator Bidel to offer some additional um, comments. Uh, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Delegate Rogers. Uh, you know, there is one movie theater in the county now that has a liquor license, but it's under a restaurant license. So this was um, a request from the liquor board to kind of clean up the regulation and make a movie theater license as other counties have done. It also in this legislation will limit the use of the wine, the drinking of the um, wine and beer and only wine and beer it takes away the, the, the liquor, the alcohol portion. So the, the wine and beer can only be consumed on premises. Um, and it also says that if you have obtained a license in some other, uh, under some other, other class, when your license renews, it should renew under the movie theater license. So those two amendments are coming. They've been drafted um, in EHE in the Senate by our specialist, Kelvin. So um, you'll be seeing those amendments by Monday, I think, for your discussion. Thank you. And Madam Chair, if I may, I can certainly go right into uh, HP. Yes, please do. And before you do that, I um, I did want to introduce uh, Judy Hagner, if she's here. I don't see her. I'm here. Judy, you're here? Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Okay, great. Okay, there you are. So um, Judy Hagner is here um, from the Anne Arundel County Liquor Board, uh, if anyone has any questions. We also have um, Wayne Harris from the Liquor Board um, available if we have any questions. Just just I wanted the dele delegates to, to have that information. Okay, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Bartlett and members of the Anne Arundel County delegation, I respectfully request a favorable report for House Bill 680. This bill requires the Board of License Commissioners to employ a chief inspector and provide for the salary of the chief inspector within pay grade 15. 
Uh, over the years, the duties of the chief inspector have grown. The chief inspector duties currently include, but are certainly not limited to, training other inspectors and, and accompanying them on several inspections, attending all liquor board meetings. Uh, they typically work in excess of 40 hours per week and during COVID verifying proper uh, COVID precautions are being taken at licensed establishments. Again, uh, I request uh, favorable support for House Bill 680. And uh, I would like to, uh, if possible, uh, acknowledge Senator Biden, who could offer some additional uh, supporting testimony. Senator Biden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Delegate, for introducing the bill. And Inspector Chief Inspector Harris is with us, if you'd like to hear from him. I have forwarded to you um, his three-page job description. So if you have not received that, um, it'll certainly be with the subcommittee on Monday to review. But um, He's doing a great job. It's just a really busy time. And I think it's gonna to continue to be a busy time as this county grows and the number of, of uh, liquor establishments grow. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Are there any questions for the sponsor of the bill or well, I see questions. Um, Delegate Saab. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, I think we, I was just looking at my floor system and I don't see uh, the or the um, fiscal note on, on the bill. Uh, Delegate Roger, can you just remind the committee or the um, the delegation, what is pay grade and then how much of an increase would that be from the current position? So I know the, the pay band or grade ranges from 40,000 to 80,000. Uh, I don't know what the current uh, pay is, I, I would uh, defer to Senator Bidel to see if she might know what that might be. Senator Bidel, or um, you? Th thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know the current um, salary, but Mr. Harris or Judy, uh, can, um, Judy Hagner can give us that information. I will say it's been a long time since this has been reviewed. And, um, you know, the, the liquor board and, and Ms. Hagner can confirm this. The liquor board is self-sustaining. They bring in enough revenues that they can handle the, an additional expense. So, um, but I'd like to have um, either Mr. Harris or um, Ms. Hagner to answer that question on his current salary. Chief Inspector or Ms. Hagner, whichever, whoever wants to respond or both. Wayne. Yes, ma'am, thank you. And thank you uh, everyone for allowing us to appear. The uh, salary right now uh, for the Chief Inspector, I believe with, uh, uh, with the expenses that were allowed, which is up to $3,000 a year for gas is only $11,000. Uh, so I've been uh, chief inspector, actually this would be one year in one week. Um, during that time, uh, I've been paid uh, on an average of five hours a week, like all of our inspectors. And um, with everything that has uh, come to being with the additional uh, licenses that were brought into uh, the entire scope of the liquor board last year, as well as the ones possibly coming this year uh, with the addition of uh, uh, licenses every year as we grow. It was, uh, it was agreed to by all the members of the board uh, from our executive director, Ms. Heigner, our administrator, Mr. Aronson, uh, of course, the chairman and commissioners of the board uh, it would be almost impossible to uh, supervise and train and oversee 20 inspectors. And that's what it is. We have 18 part-time inspectors that work an average of five hours a week, 20 hours a month. I have one deputy chief who also like myself and the inspector works five hours a week, or I should say is paid five hours a week. And uh, then of course myself, since I was sworn in February 1st of last year, uh, I've probably averaged 35 hours a week, every week since then. Of course, a lot of that's attributed to the COVID uh, situation we're all in. And uh, so to answer your, you know, your question, I believe my salary, including expenses is $11,000 a year uh, at present. What is the kind of, Madam Chairman, just if I can follow up. So it goes to pay grade 15. What is the grade now for, just an inspector. 
how much of a difference of a great pay grade would be. Madam Chair, this is Judy Hagner. Um, there is no grade limited to the inspectors or the chief or deputy because they're part-time positions. Okay, but I heard Delegate Beidel saying that it's within pay grade 15, so. It would move from no grade to a grade 15. Okay, all right, I appreciate that. I'm actually on the subcommittee, so we can discuss that a little bit more in detail. I just want to get some clarification. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Delegate Nick, De Delegate Kipke. Uh, my question, I think, has been answered, but I'll follow up. My question has been answered. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Delegate Chisholm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I've been trying to spend a lot of time figuring this out, but since it was brought up, I know that the liquor board is self-sustaining. All of the revenue goes directly from liquor fees directly to the liquor board. And or are you a completely different part of the budget in Anne Arundel County? when they do their budget or is all the money directed through the comptroller to the liquor board or does it go directly to the liquor board? Now, what I'm, all I'm trying to do is figure out if we do have a, a big increase in pay, is there an increase in liquor fees or where exactly does the revenue come from? I know you're one of the few agencies or you're probably the only board that's in a surplus typically. Am I correct on that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, and this is, I'm sorry, this is Judy Hagner again. Um, currently, our money, we've received the, the checks into our office. They get deposited into a state bank account. Every quarter, I receive um, correspondence from the state asking, have we gotten everything that we purchased? And I always say yes. And then that turn on that quarter of the year, Mr. Kelly submits all the money back to Anne Arundel County. So we basically, I'm sure we're gonna be taking in less this year because of COVID. Um, we've lost considerable amount of licenses. And I mean, we will still have a revenue. Now everything that we do not spend in that budget goes back to the Anne Arundel County General Fund, which is okay. always over three to $400,000. Okay, because I do, I do know last year there was, I think there was a close to a million dollars in fees if I added yes, up sir. every liquor license. Yes, yes, sir, it was. And you got, so your your operating budget is usually 600,000 to 700 based on the yeah, rationale you just. That's true. This year it's going to go up to about 800,000. We have to purchase a new database. Um, ours is about 20 years old and it is failing every day. So the new database is going to cost us around $150,000, but it should last us 10 to 15 years. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any further questions? And keep in mind that the alcohol committee will be meeting on Monday, the uh, 15th at, uh, Vice Mr. Vice Chair, can you remind us again what time? Yes, um, Madam Chair, we'll be meeting on Monday, February 8th at 1 p.m. And all of, the, all of the documents and, and memoranda have has gone to the subcommittee. I, I'm going to make one slight change uh, to our agenda, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to go ahead and since we're listening to alcohol bills, I'd like to listen to the last and final alcohol bill, um, and then um, Delegate Howard, then hear your bill. Do you, do, is that, would that be all right with you and your witness? Oh, absolutely not. Sure, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Delegate Howard. Uh, and at this time, the chair um, will um, step back and ask uh, Mr. Vice Chair if he would preside over the meeting, given that um, I have a bill coming up. So, so done, Madam Chair. All right, um, Delegate Bartlett, uh, would you like to present uh, the next alcohol bill, House Bill 900? 
Thank you. The House Bill 900 is an Anne Arundel County Alcohol Beverage Board of License Commissions Commissioners. I'd like to present this with my good Senator, Senator Beidel. Um, the bill is very simple. On page two, you will see that we um, propose five members of the board, change from three members of the board, uh, and one from each legislative district in our county. Um, the only other uh, changes are uh, on page uh, three, in which we are proposing that the um, terms of the members be staggered uh, as uh, required by the um, terms provided uh, for members of the board on, which will be effective Ju July 1st, 2021. And any member may not serve more than four consecutive terms. So those are the changes, minor changes in the sense of, uh, of drafting. Um, Senator Beidel, would you like to add anything more? Uh, Madam Chair, I think you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Beidel. Uh, I don't have any witnesses at this time. Mr. Vice Chair, unless there are questions that could be answered. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Delegate Bartlett. At this time, are there any questions from the delegation? Delegate Saad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, um, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the bill. Um, how are they currently appointed? So we have three members now and they're appointed by, just figure out how are they being appointed and who would appoint the fifth? Would it be, the delegation or would it be the liquor board? Could you explain that to us, please? Sure, Madam Chair, or M Mr. Chair, may I answer that? Uh, yes, Senator Biden. So currently the three members are appointed through a letter from through the governor. Um, letters of support go to the, uh, the governor through the executive nominations committee and then they're approved by executive noms. So that wouldn't change, but instead of being um, three members right now from anywhere in the county. So right now there's two from District 33, one from District 32. The other districts are not represented. So this would change just the fact that there'd be one from each legislative district, but the process of how they're appointed wouldn't change. So basically it's a political appointment and it would make it more of a political appointment when you add five members. I don't know how it becomes more of a political appointment. It's the same. You have five members, right? Well, you have five. Right. You, well, you have five you're adding two extra members, which you know, I, I personally, I think the board should be maybe a professional appointment, not a political appointment. But again, we can we can maybe discuss that in in committee. Uh, in well, and I, I'm not proposing how we change the appointment, um, but this is a concern we've had in the last couple of years. Several health issues where one of the three have been out for an extended period of time, and then you only have two commissioners. And if they can't agree on an issue, the person comes in front of the board and doesn't, doesn't get a response either way. It's not up or down. They just don't, you know, it, it's a tie. And I don't think that's a good way to do government. I also think that each district should be represented by someone from that district that knows the area and the establishments. But thank you, Delegate Saab. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of the delegation? Delegate Chisholm. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I think I just jumped in front of Delegate Kipke, unless it's, but. Um, so I guess this is for Ms. Hagner, I would assume. So if we add these two new commissioners, what would their salary be? And would they then start to take up some of the, the surplus that we currently experience through the committee or through the board? Yes, sir. Um, Judy Hagner with the Liquor Board. Their salary would be fifteen thousand dollars a year. They do. They can put in for expenses, which right now we only have one commissioner doing that. Um, so you're looking at thirty thousand dollars a year for those two positions. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Delegate Kipke. Uh, no, I don't have a question. Thank you. Okay. Are, are there any other questions from members of the delegation? Uh, seeing none, that concludes testimony for House Bill 900.
And at this time, I'd like to turn it back over to Madam Chair Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Great job. We're going to move on to now to uh, Delegate Howard's bill, House Bill 843, Anne Arundel County Natural, Natural Resources Fishing with a, with a Hall Sign. Uh, Delegate Howard, uh, please introduce the bill along with um, any witnesses you have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, all. It's good to see everyone. Uh, this is a revisit from last year, uh, 843, the Hall Sane bill is basically in the same format as last year's bill, except we carved out the Severn River. Uh, this bill passed this committee unanimously last year. It passed ENT unanimously last year, and it passed the House of Delegates the entire floor unanimously last year. So this is just a revisit from last year's bill. But again, it's in the same format, including uh, last year we had a letter of support uh, from the agency, Department of Natural Resources. I'm working on getting that updated letter of support now. I su suspect I will have that in the next couple of days. And uh, again, the bill is essentially the same, except we carved out the Severn River, um, which was, was in last year's bill. I do have a, a witness here, uh, Julia Howes, who would like to testify. And she is, I believe, representing the, uh, oh, we also have some letters of support from the Anne Arundel County Waterman, should be in your file or in the email file. And um, so with that, I'll turn it over to my uh, witness. Julia. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Okay, thank you. Good morning. My name is Julia Howes, and I'm a resident of Anne Arundel County and Commercial Waterman TFL license number 1419. Yes, I hold a license and I'm a female. My husband and I own a seafood company where we provide only fresh and local seafood direct to the public. We have built a business selling only what we catch so we can guarantee the quality and provide the best product to the customer. Today, I am asking for your support on House Bill 843, Fishing with a Halsane. Last year, many watermen testified in front of you for HB 95. This bill was supported by Maryland DNR and the testimony stated, many of the county specific fishing statues are decades old and no longer reflect current management issues or local stakeholder issues. The last meaningful change to this stature in particular was 1981. My husband and I were not even born in 1981, yet we are still bound by the rule that is outdated and creates a regulatory burden on the commercial fishing industry. This bill passed unanimously last year in this council. We are asking for you to support it again this year, especially with the amendment set forth. This bill could help us be able to fish a different gear type and be able to provide bait fish for our other fisheries. The primary reason we are working towards being able to use the Halsane is to be able to catch bait fish, such as menhaden and mud shad. These fish are important to our fisheries, including crabbing. Maryland crabbing season is nine months out of the year, and we rely heavily on these fish throughout the season. This net keeps the fish and other species we catch in the net alive so we can sort and then release what we are not keeping. The net does not harm or damage the fish. Right now, we are the only county in the state that restricts this type of gear. Every other waterman in the state is currently allowed to use the Halsey net, and we ask that you provide us equality and being able to join our colleagues across the state. Thank you in advance for your support on Bill 843 and allowing Anne Arundel County watermen to use the gear type Halsey. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Halls. Um, are there any questions for the bill sponsor or witness? Madam Chair, I have a question. Delegate Henson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Howard, for reintroducing the bill. I got to learn a lot about the whole same fishing technique last year when um, you had the graphics and everything that uh, really illustrated what the bill does. I would like to understand, is there any, or what, what is the position of some of our environmental advocacy groups about the, about the bill itself? Well, I don't know that you would have to ask them. They didn't testify against it last year and they certainly haven't made any motions throughout the state to remove any other Hall Sane gear operations uh, in, any, in any other jurisdictions. As stated by the witness, that we believe we're the only jurisdiction that does not allow Hall Sane. Thank you, Delegate Howard. Appreciate your diligence on it. Any further questions for the sponsor or witness? 
That concludes the testimony for House Bill 4, House Bill 443. I'd like to thank uh, Chief Inspector Harris for coming out today, Ms. Hagner and Ms. Howells. And Ms. Howells, I will not hold it against you that you were born before, oh, after, you weren't born in 1981. I will not hold that against you. <laughs> Point of order, Madam, Madam Chair, I, I felt a little old too, because I was born in 74, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Well, thank you um, to all the witnesses for being here today. I appreciate that. Um, appreciate you taking the time out to be here. Next, we're going to move uh, in our agenda on over to our esteemed mayor for the city of Annapolis, Mr. Gavin Buckley. Hello, how you all doing? Right. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, so good morning. Uh, these uh, these meetings are quite a little bit unusual, not what we're used to um, here in the city of Annapolis. Uh, before I get a few short remarks, I'd like to introduce city of Annapolis is a city manager, David Gerald, uh, who has come to the meeting with me. You all know him really well. He's doing an amazing job with the city. Thank you, David. Um, while I personally uh, like the virtual testimony aspect, especially um, after I delivered the, the remarks on a bill to Senator Elfrith that she has championed to help our arts in public places with funding from hotel tax. Uh, and um, I support, I want you guys to support that bill as well, please, when it comes to you. Um, we um, certainly, um, arts are a big, important part of this city. Um, the thing that I don't like about these virtual meetings, though, is that you're not downtown as much as you used to be. And all the people that come to support you, we miss them. Uh, we miss you all, <laughs> but we need your help uh, to, uh, and support for our businesses through this pandemic. Um, please give our businesses legislative and financial relief uh, by dining and shopping in Annapolis whenever you guys can. Uh, and please tell your colleagues and friends to do that. The city doesn't have a big legislative push this year, but I do ask that you consider continuing the effort on payment in lieu of taxes, our uh, pilot. I wanna tell you a little bit about what our city's public safety team did just a few weeks ago to keep you all safe. We all know what happened at the Capitol in Washington, D.C. on January the 6th. Although we watched it on our TVs, it is only 30 miles from Maryland and your state house. A week later, we got notifications from the FBI and the Maryland State Police that state capitals across the country were going to be similarly targeted. You saw how the Capitol Police were overwhelmed. You don't have to have, they don't have nearly the security in place to keep you safe. They rely on public safety teams around them. The city of Annapolis's public safety team did what they always do. They worked with county, state and federal law enforcement partners. They held emergency preparedness meetings to get police, fire, and the Office of Emergency Management on the same page. Even with COVID and all the overtime we spent on dealing with that, they stepped up to ensure your safety and the safety of our residents and the visitors who live in proximity to the State House and other state government buildings. For five straight days, you they had stepped up around the clock for protection. Our residents foot the bill. Throughout the pandemic, our bottom line has been decimated while we continue spending to keep the city functions and public safety at the forefront. We need a pilot, we need it funded in order to continue to do the work we've been doing. It has not increased in decades. We are a First Amendment city. We provide support for protesters and marches all the time. The Right for Life had a protest here 
just last night that we staffed with our patrols. So please, please restore our pilot. Very quickly on the city dock, our Hillman garage, we've signed a pre-development agreement for the rebuilding of Hillman and we'll break ground at the beginning of next year. The vendor team we have, uh, uh, will have a website up soon and I encourage you to check out what we have planned for modernizing transportation for our residents and visitors. Annapolis has the ability to showcase sustainability and resilience efforts for the world. We are a historic city and we treasure our past, but we are also a town with an eye towards the future. So thank you all for your time. Enjoy your home away from home here in the city of Annapolis. We're glad to have you back. Thank you for all the work that you are doing and thank you for supporting the city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The house will be back for floor sessions beginning Monday, February 8th. So we'll see what we can do to uh, stimulate the economy in Annapolis. Uh, Mr. Durrell, did, did, did Mr. Durrell have anything he wanted to um, add? No, thank you. It's good to be with you this morning. Good to see familiar faces. So thank you. Good to see you as well. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, you have a, a comment or question? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I have a question for the mayor. I, I just wanted to ask if I heard, overheard him say that the first round next week would be on him while we're in that. <laughs> Did I hear that, Mr. Mayor? That is always true. You know where I am. <laughs> so uh, I, I know a few places. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very good. Um, do we have any other questions or comments for Mr. Mayor, uh, Delegate Henson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Mayor, thank you for including in your remarks the, the, the necessity for the pilot funding to be increased. It was disappointing when the governor's budget cut the pilot funding back down to the old levels and not the, the levels that Senator Alfred and um, our former speaker, Mike Bush, fought really hard for to keep the city with some sort of support that would recognize the effort that the city puts into making sure that the state's capital stays safe. Um, you also have the benefit of having the chair of the capital budget subcommittee and the vice chair of the appropriations committee on the line with you as well. There are a number of uh, projects that they'll be reviewing in their respective budgets that will impact the city of Annapolis, namely the Stanton Community Center and Annapolis, Peerless Renz in Annapolis and a few other capital projects. Um, could you speak to how the, the state's budget supporting some of the capital projects that are done in Annapolis is a benefit to your work as well? I think it's, it's all about money, right? We all would like to do everything possible um, to make our cities better and to make a, 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 more, a much more livable place for all, uh, all of the community that we live in. Um, but it's not possible without funding. Um, and uh, we, we know that most municipalities' revenues are flat. They're especially flat uh, when you consider what we've just come through. Um, so, you know, when we uh, feel the love from the state, we, we certainly appreciate what you're doing. And, um, and the great thing is you can come and see your work when you come here every year and see how you've improved people's lives. So I want to say thank you for considering our asks. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Bagnall. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for being here today. Um, I actually want to, to, um, to echo Delegate Henson's comments on, um, on the pilot program and, and thank you for, for drawing that line of demarcation from the, the Capitol in DC to the Capitol in Maryland, because I think sometimes we forget the local impact of national events. Um, and, and there was definitely a, a very clear local impact in, in Annapolis. And, and I, I really appreciate you drawing that, that parallel for us and also the, um, the efforts that, uh, that Annapolis made to ensure that, that, that we were securing our state capital and the people that, that live here and work here. Thank you. And I know it must be very personal for all of you. You see your Capitol Police officers <clears throat> every day when you come in and, you know, they're just regular people like the rest of us. And I'm sure that none of them expected what happened to them that day to happen. And 
and they were overwhelmed, right? And so, um, you know, we all work together to make sure that we keep our, um, our most sacred places safe. So thank you. Delegate Howard. You know, I'll, I'm going to I'm going to contact uh, Mayor Buckley directly on my question. Thank you. With that said, I see no further questions or comments. Mayor Buckley, please come back again and visit as you wish, and we will be seeing you soon as Thank we um, as we have that first round on you. <laughs> <laughs> Just call me. You, you all have my number. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Durrell. Thank you. Our last item on our agenda, very importantly, we have uh, members from the Anne Arundel County Mental Health Agency, Ms. Adrian Mickler, Ms. Catherine Gray, and Ms. Jennifer Corbin. Um, let's go, unless you all have, um, do you have a particular order in which you'd like to speak? Actually, we do. If okay. Cool. Ms. Mickler, would you like to be first? Are you first? I would, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and Honorable Delegates. My name is Adrian Michler, and I'm the director for the Anne Arundel County Mental Health Agency. Um, with me is Catherine Gray, the deputy director of the agency, and Jennifer Corbin, the director of our crisis response system. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning, and we really appreciate this opportunity. I'd like to take just a, a few moments to review our system highlights for you. Um, then Catherine will describe one of our new and exciting programs. And then Ben will go over some of how we're managing our crisis system through COVID. But first, I have to say how proud I am of our agency and our county. How quickly we were able to pivot to virtual offices, how we've maintained almost 100% of our operations during the pandemic, and being able to support our community and providers without skipping a beat is truly testimony to the dedication and professionalism of our staff and those of our county and community partners. So as you can see, our agency is a 501c3 corporation and we are the mental health authority for our county. Our 17 member board of directors also functions as our mental health advisory committee. <clears throat> and with our department of health, we form the local behavioral health authority. There continues to be a lot of discussion about integration. So we've listed some of the ways that our corporate structure enhance our local system. COVID really accentuated this critical need and the advantages of our public-private partnership that we enjoy in Anne Arundel County. Most notably, speed, flexibility, and the ability to coordinate with other county departments. A lot of this was made possible by leveraging solid relationships that had been established and with our crisis response system serving as such a pivotal component of our county's emergency preparedness. Our functional integration model with our Department of Health clearly gives us the best of both worlds. All right, uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Thank you. Our role as local managers includes functions such as planning, developing, and managing our continuum of care. Again, COVID reminds us that this local function isn't a luxury we were able to quickly advocate for our providers for things such as telehealth and personal protective equipment, ensuring capacity and continuity of care for those most vulnerable individuals who reside in our county and depend on us. We make sure that services are available and coordinated so that valuable resources are not wasted through duplication. We promote innovation and above all, we are outcome driven and results oriented. Our values are embedded in everything that we do and they're listed here. Of these, the most important is that first one. Above all, we are patient-centered and this is the key in all healthcare. We've got to listen to what the individual needs or we're never gonna be effective. This is just a visual representation of our integration model in our county. And then briefly, we enjoy um, a staff of 95 individuals. We have 63 full-time and 32 part-time staff. The next few pages just list some of our key functions and our role as systems managers. Uh, for example, we operate our crisis response system. We monitor 92 grantees and contracts, but everything else on these slides, whether it's through direct funding, advocating, coordinating with other departments, investigating complaints, whatever it takes, 
The purpose of everything we do is to make sure that our residents get the right level of behavioral health care when they need it, and that the care is available, accessible, and of high quality. Slide 11. The next three slides are just for a little bit of fun, and you have this presentation, but I just wanted to emphasize the complexity of our system, but I have to say it's not limited to just behavioral health. Our entire health care delivery system is complicated. A little tweak here can have a huge impact over there, so it's important that we think it through and get it right. So slide 12, you might be familiar with this one from last year, but this is what our crisis system looks like. And in a few minutes, Jen can explain our newest edition, which is in blue, and we're very grateful for this. Um, it's our behavioral health alternative shelter. And this, along with telehealth, are at least two of the silver linings for us of COVID. Um, 13 is just a little view into our planning process and all of our partnerships. And again, you can just see how complex it is. And finally, the last slide for me, this is just some of the reasons why in our county and elsewhere, all roads for us lead to our crisis system. Because it really is intended to be that no wrong door for behavioral health. When other systems kind of let you down or just can't accommodate an individual's needs, our crisis system really is a true safety net. So the rest of the slides actually describe the crisis system. So I'm going to stop here and ask Catherine if she could describe one of our new and exciting programs, which is a little enhancement to our crisis system, and then we'll turn it over to Jen. Sure. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you to the delegation for taking the time to listen to us this morning. So the program I wanted to share with you this morning is a new program. It's our mental health stabilization program. And this program, um, when we are looking at our crisis system as a whole, we're constantly looking at how we can fill gaps in our system, particularly around services to youth and families. So this mental health stabilization service really does help to fill one of those gaps um, for families between an initial crisis and connecting families to ongoing services. So we applied um, and were awarded this mental health stabilization um, grant back in 2020. By September of 2020, um, we were fully operational. Uh, it's not a ton of funding. Um, it's enough funding. It does fund half of a crisis team, but it also, the, the new portion of it, is it funds one master's level mental health professional to provide home and community-based supports to families um, and youth that are referred from social services and from crisis response. So by having the supported transition from initial crisis um, to ongoing community-based treatment, it really does minimize the family's risk of remaining in crisis and also reduces the risk of out-of-home placement and hospitalization for children, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. So some of the elements that get addressed during this eight-week stabilization program can be anything from um, building the family social support system, connecting youth and families to ongoing supports and services, um, learning de-escalation techniques, helping build resiliency skills, um, helping with patterns of communication within the family. We always do a safety plan for a family and then figuring out what caregiver supports and advocacy may need to be done. And the program builds on the existing strengths within a family. So we're always looking at what do they already have that we're just gonna build on. So in fiscal year 20, we had 30 families enrolled. Um, our average age was about 11. Um, we do wanna get families in um, as quickly as possible. So we, we, um, we've noticed that our age range is, is pretty young. Um, in that fiscal year, we only had one youngster who needed a brief alternate placement. Um, and during the pandemic, we have actually remained operational 
Uh, we never stop providing services to families. We have moved to a hybrid model, a mix of in-person and virtual, but that's really dependent on the family's preference. Um, in fiscal year 21, which just has two quarters, we have 12 families, um, both referrals from social services and from crisis. Uh, we have noticed that our families' needs have intensified during COVID, uh, but the program is still able to meet all of the family needs. So in terms of outcomes, how do we know that it's working? So the assessment tool we use is actually called an ECBI, and this is a weekly assessment tool that the, the caregiver, the, the parents actually complete. And it looks at both um, intensity and frequency of behaviors. So every week the, when we meet with families, they go through, only takes about three or four minutes, and they just look at in the last week, how intense were the behaviors and those very specific questions. Um, and then how frequent are those behaviors? And one of the things that we have been very pleased with is that we have seen significant decreases in scores in both intensity and frequency of behaviors over the, that eight week period. And at the end of the eight weeks, each family is actually given their ECBI scores and you can see the numbers going down in both. Um, so what happens at discharge? Eight weeks seems like a pretty short time period, and it is. Um, it's not intended to be a long, long-term program. It really is intended to be a transitional program. So when we're discharging families, we have them connected to their ongoing community supports, and those can include um, individual and family therapy, uh, substance use services, somatic care, mentoring programs, employment services, um, psychiatric rehab services, uh, care coordination, and anything that the child and family may be eligible for, um, they can connect to the services while we're with them. And then as we're transitioning out, those services are becoming the primary services. So this has been a nice addition to our crisis response system. And I'm gonna segue over to Jen, who is gonna talk about our comprehensive crisis response system. Thanks, Catherine. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say that I'd first like to give kudos to my crisis staff here. Um, through COVID, we never stopped running 24-7, uh, responding in person to every call with police, fire, to the hospitals. Um, and I think what people don't realize is we became the county's kind of go-to for that reason, um, for Department of Social Services, for the health department, you know, when someone needed a well check, someone needed a certain service, we were that agency that went out for them and checked on the individual, gave feedback, um, created a huge partnership with our Department of Social Services through COVID and working with our homeless population. Um, a lot of people don't realize the need of our homeless population during COVID to be quarantined if positive for COVID, um, working with families. Um, one thing that Catherine talked about uh, when talking about our crisis system was, though there's been a lot of success in telehealth and people connecting to therapy, um, IOP for substance use, there's a lot of people who were not successful with that and needed more face-to-face -face interaction. And our crisis system became that opportunity to do that. Um, if an agency felt like some, they were concerned about someone on telehealth, we were the ones that are going out and could putting eyes on that individual to make sure they're okay. Um, and if someone needed regular visits, we were doing that as well through COVID. Um, so kind of just talking a little bit about our crisis system as a whole, our warm line has seen an increase in calls for service during COVID because we are 24 seven. Um, What's been really interesting um, through a lot of this, as people know, a lot of people calling into the warm line instead of 911. Early on, we were getting a lot of calls for people who wanted us to come out and help them because of maybe the social unrest and the need for an intervention, but not necessarily being comfortable with police responding. Um, we have done a lot of community policing over the last um, nine months in regards to that using our crisis intervention teams, which is our officer who's trained in mental health paired with one of our licensed clinicians. 
And that has been a great way for us to talk with someone on the phone about their concerns and their uneasiness, but still allowing us to respond and to us what's a safe manner, but also meeting that person on the phone um, part way to make sure we're listening to them and hearing their concerns. Um, one of the things I am concerned about leading into school starting back up is that our calls for service for kids has gone down, mainly because when they're not in school, we don't notice as much, right? A lot of our calls for kids is during the school time or a follow-up call after school. So when I say that, my concern is that our numbers went up during COVID, but they went up on the adult side. So when you factor back in schools, uh, the school stuff, I'm looking at what our volume will be in regards to having the, the kid population inserted back into our call volume. Um, one of the other things that has been unique about our system through COVID is because school was not in session, um, we were able to have five of our student resource officers assigned to our unit um, to pair with clinicians. Um, and what's really cool about that initiative is that schools were able to email our CIT Lieutenant uh, Thomas, who could then put a list together for well checks. So if someone wasn't signing on virtually or they, someone who was really good in school, his grades are really falling and a teacher's concerned, we were able to reach out and say, hey, how can we help? Um, we do checks on those students to see if the parents need anything. Is there any concern on signing on to the internet? Do they have a computer? All of those things. So we've been working a lot with our school system on that piece. Um, instead of kind of going over the whole system because our system is so robust, it would take me a long time to really go over every unit. Um, I know you guys know how successful our safe station program is um, in regards to addressing the heroin epidemic. Um, what I will tell you is that's still working great. It's it goes up and down. Um, I, there's no rhyme or reason. There are weeks that we get a lot of people showing up wanting help, and then we have weeks that are lower. Um, I think we're at a point in our system where a lot of people know us and they're calling into the warm line for help now instead of needing to may maybe go to the fire stations. Um, to get their help. So that's a real positive to that is they know now how to link to the resources they need. Um, and the last thing I just want to um, briefly talk about because I want to give you guys some time to answer questions is what Adrian was talking about with our behavioral uh, health shelter. So while COVID has been negative, one of our positives was in, in faced with um, a situation with Department of Social Services, we found something that worked. Um, we had early on, we're putting our, so normally we have winter relief, let's start there. And winter relief is where the church is usually housed through um, the winter months, our homeless population. Um, this year, because of COVID, you could not do that because it's too close of a quarters for congregate living. So we use a hotel to house individuals and we were pairing them up into rooms. Well, what we found is that in doing that, there wasn't enough supervision for people who may have behavioral health needs and that people were decomping in those situations. And so a couple, a month or so into that, um, I was tasked with a way um, with DSS to come up with an alternate placement for individuals that have behavioral health needs. So I had all of about a week to figure it out because what was happening is we were getting, we, the crisis system was getting increased calls every day to the hotel. And I was like, you know, this is getting a little daunting to have to go out there regularly. So I talked with a few of our providers in the community and do you know, um, three providers stepped up and opened up places for us to house individuals with substance use or mental health issues and they put a supervised staff there. And basically what it is for people who are homeless who may be in recovery, but very early in their recovery, or someone that has mental health who has come out of an inpatient stay or is chronic homeless, but really needs a little more supervision than being on their own. We were able to place them in these behavioral alternate shelters. Um, and I have to tell you, I can't believe the success we've had that I don't know that we had with some chronic homeless ever before. Um, and what I've learned from the situation is that 
allowing a little more time for someone to stabilize and be supervised and then move them on um, in a positive way has been pretty impactful for the individuals who've been placed in our, um, our shelter. And what I mean by that is it, because their meds are locked up and a, and a staff will say, hey, it's nine o'clock, you need to take your meds. The person comes in, takes their meds, goes back to what they're doing. The other thing was because they're in front of us at these shelters, they're making it to their therapy appointments. They're making it to their substance use treatment. And these are things that we kind of knew, but in our homeless population, we've always struggled with. The other reason this was successful was because of COVID, people were coming out of treatment and there was nowhere to put them because a lot of programs weren't taking people in at risk of COVID. So they were shutting down or containing their programs. This allowed us to get people back on their feet while they're waiting for their next placement. Um, so that has been um, something that um, Adrian and I are looking at. How do we keep that after COVID? How do we keep that going? Because it is something that has been um, uh, has really changed the lives of several individuals uh, in our community. Um, so that's kind of everything in a nutshell. If there's, I'll kind of open it up to questions you guys might have for us. Well, we do have questions. Thank you very much um, for that presentation. And we appreciate the work that you all do. And we appreciate the 24 um, seven work that you do. And um, so thank you very much um, for your dedication and your commitment. Uh, it is quite commendable. Um, Delegate Lehman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for the presentation. Um, it's very impressive, the, the work you're doing. I think other counties could learn a lot from some of these models. Um, in terms of the mental health stabilization program for young people, uh, if I understood correctly, it's grant funded. Um, it sounds like a very successful model. Will you try to continue it um, after the, the, the grant funding uh, ends? Or are you gonna look for um, replacement funding to keep it going? So the grant comes from the Department of Human Resources to the Behavioral Health Administration, and that's who we applied to. We are sending all of our data to them. Um, we're also working with several other counties to help them get a program like this up and running. Um, so both DHR and uh, Behavioral Health Administration are very pleased with this kind of program. So yes, we do intend to, to keep this operational. That's, that's great to hear. And just for my future reference, um, because I've had parents raise this uh, challenge, this question to me over the years, um, are there any day programs in, uh, you know, outside of hospitalization in Anne Arundel County for um, adolescents? By day program, are you talking about like a partial hospital program? Right, it, a partial hospitalization extension uh, following hospitalization when, you know, continued services are needed. I know those seem to be hard to come by in, in different parts of the state. Sure. So partial hospital programs are run through hospitals, but there are other services, psychiatric rehab programs um, in particular is the one I'm thinking about where it really is providing more supports to the youngster. And they have that both in the children's system and in the adult system. And those PRP type programs, that's our largest type of um, program that we have in our public system. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to talk to you offline a little bit more about that. Sure, thank you. absolutely. Uh, Delegate Saab. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, I got to tell you, uh, Jen, Catherine, Adrian, I always look forward uh, to you guys come every year to our delegation. Your, your um, dedication is, is unbelievable and it's, it's pretty contagious. And I think the, the county owes you uh, that gratitude for, for all the work that you do. And uh, if, if you don't mind, if you can share uh, some of the, the presentation that you have with the delegation, I would really appreciate it. And I think one of you, uh, I think it was um, uh, Jen, uh, mentioned uh, the school, the SROs and, and the effectiveness of them in our school. And uh, I'm sure you're aware there are, uh, there's a couple of bills, or there's a bill that calls for the removal uh, of the SROs. Uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just like you to reiterate to the delegation because a lot of them will probably have the opportunity to vote on, on such bills and remind them how important the SROs are and how important they will be when we go back to school because COVID made your job a lot bigger and, and harder 
uh, that it has been in the past. So um, again, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just really want you to uh, reiterate and tell us a little bit more about the effectiveness and how well you work together with the SROs. Well, I think we're very unique in our county and, and blessed unbelievably by the fact that we have one chiefs that are invested in our community and community policing um, that our SROs are trained not only in mental health first aid, but mental, they're in both. They have the adult version and the youth version. So they're trained to identify signs and symptoms. They don't see their job as just enforcement, but they see themselves as involved in the community. I can't speak outside of Anne Arundel County and what SROs do, but our SROs are trained very differently here and that our leadership allows us to have them involved. And it's been so nice because through this, though we have five officers here, they rotate. So every officer gets a chance to work with the clinician and get that feeling of what it's like to do those mental health calls. So um, for us in the county, that I, is, which I can only speak to, is a very valuable piece in our school system. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, last question, De Delegate Heather Bagnall. And before that, um, we will have uh, the slides present um, available to us and we will have contact information for um, Ms. Uh, Mike Mickler, Mikler and um, uh, Catherine Gray. And Adrian, we worked on the task force together. So I remember you and Catherine, hello, good to see you. <laughs> and Jen, always good to see you. But um, so we will have contact information available. Last question, Del Delegate Bagnell. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and th thank you all for the presentation and for the work that you do. I, I'm 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 always in awe of of your entire team, um, and and I I often I often you know reach out to uh, to Lieutenant Thomas and and to Officer Schwartz and you know and the whole team for for uh, for information. Um, I I wanted to circle back a little bit, uh, Jen, with um, regarding the behavioral health alternative shelter. Um, and, and how we can support that because it sounds like it's been really successful. And I'm wondering if there is a, a view to um, potentially serving the need that, that we often find in our community, which is um, families who have an adult member of their family with a mental health crisis because they're, it's, it's, a, it's a gap community. We don't, you know, we, we don't have services that are robust to get them into placement to keep them in, in treatment. And I'm wondering if, if, if this might be um, potentially that, that, that gap. Yeah, I think what's unique, and I think I knew it, but seeing it is different, is our difference between we have what's called crisis bed services where people can go and stabilize to reintegrate into the community for, it's about 10 days. But the problem is some people need more than that. There's also people who, since our, our, state facilities have lessened, just needing that constant need of supervision. Now we have what's called RRP, residential programs that are out there. The problem right now is the wait list is so great. And this is where the alternate shelter is making a huge impact. And I think I always knew we needed something, but it wasn't until we did this that I see the need and that that's it's a gap in service we've always had. I just never had a solution. And it's just by accident with COVID that we've run across it, I think. How it's gonna sustain, I do not know. That's the thing, that's kind of the unknown piece right now. Um, you know, my next goal is to really start looking at outcome measures. This was really just supposed to be a get through COVID thing, uh, but now I'm starting to see it might need to be a little more. So I've gotta kind of have to go back and look at some measures to see so that I can present. I think then I'll leave it to Adrian to figure out how we're gonna move forward. Then it's my problem. Um, and working with Jen, what we did, we, we're on it. We're starting to look at numbers and outcomes and like everything else in our system. You know, I, I hate to say it's complicated, but we have to right size it. So we know what it had to be during COVID, but once we come out of COVID, what does that look like for our community? How does it fit into our continuum? And how do we really make it so that um, we can see the benefit and the sustainability work in concert with the rest of what we have. So that's kind of what we're starting to develop right now. Thank you so much. And we really appreciate it. And please do let us know how we can support that work because I, I, I think this, this work is, is absolutely invaluable and so necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. 
and um, we will be in touch. Um, do we have any um, announcements or uh, Delegate Rogers? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just again, I know that some folks uh, dialed in late, but I'd just like to remind everyone, delegation dues, um, please make sure you get those in. Thank you for the four who have already uh, turned them in. Um, I know we'll be here next week, so um, I'll come looking for you. Any other um, questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. In, uh, uh, Delegate Pena Melnick. I have to say that it is very easy to pay your dues. I paid them through Venmo. Sienna went ahead and scheduled Venmo, so you don't even have to write a check. Just do a quick transfer. You can pay me later, uh, Delegate Rogers. <laughs> uh, uh, th thank you, uh, Delegate Peter Melnick and Delegate Bagno and Delegate Malone. I, I really appreciate the four, three of you making my job easier. Oh, I, I didn't think you were going to name names, Mr. Rogers. Wait, wait, wait till next week. <laughs> Did you name you, right. Mr. Vice Chairman? Let's make sure we utilize. Oh, yeah, I paid. That, that was the sure fourth we... in case you were counting. <laughs> I'd, Let's I'd make like sure to, we utilize. Like to, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to make one announcement. Um, following up on last week, we did raise $35,000 for Special Olympics, and I'd like to give a special shout out to Delegate Mike Rogers, who decided to show up just when I was getting in the tank, and they let him throw from the kids' line, and he knocked me down. <laughs> so, so I so appreciate if, if, that. If, if I may respond, it was a wonderful event, but my only regret was that I didn't get a chance to dunk Delegate Sid Saab. I did. <laughs> you know, that's, that's perfect, because I was going to ask, how did it go? I saw them setting um, up, so I was wondering how it went. Um, so, uh, Delegate uh, Henson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the diligence of our Vice Chair brought to my attention. Um, I think that we are, oh, I know, we are still in Black History Month, and I believe that our Vice Chair chairing the meeting um, while you were presenting your bill may have been a first for us here in Anne Arundel County, and I just wanted to acknowledge i um, proud of the leadership we have here and the diversity that it represents, and our Vice Chair, I believe, being the very first African-American male to chair a delegation meeting for a period, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Very good, very good. Okay, um, is there a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Second. We are adjourned. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Stay safe.